webcast presentation. Permanent tax regulation plus the federal research credit equals competitive advantage, presented by Corporate Tax Advisors. My name is Olivia Jones with SWI Group. Thank you for joining this webcast. First, some general information. If you have any technical difficulties, please submit a question and one of our associates will get back to you. Viewers of archive webcasts must complete a quiz to receive continuing education credit. If you are with us live, you will receive an email with your certificate within the next few days. Today's presenter is Dawson Bircho, partner at Car Corporate Tax Advisors. So let's get started. Dawson, I'll hand it over to you. Well, Olivia, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just a couple of administrative things. Um, my gut tells me there are quite a few of you on the broadcast today have re ran through um, a similar webinar uh, sort of uh, function and so relative to q and I'm going to do my best um, there will be a slide at the very end of the presentation for us to, to handle those Q&A's but if, if you do have a question that's pertinent to a slide that is up at that point in time please do use that chat, chat function and I'll do um, our best we'll do our best um, including Olivia to call those out um, and trying to answer the questions at, the, at that time so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, just uh, wanted to thank everyone for listening on the broadcast today. I'm pretty confident that there are many other uh, tasks and, and priorities on your respective plates and why, again, I appreciate you for tuning in for the 50 or so minutes today. Um, the content I'm going to present uh, this afternoon is most likely going to be a review for some um, and potentially a completely new topic for others and maybe a combination for the other 70 or so firms on the on the phone today, but my gut tells me that some of it, um, the new permits of the code might be uh, relatively new to everybody. Um, you know, this change to what the Congress calls the Federal Research and Development Tax Credit. Uh, it was recently re-legislated um, in the uh, winter of 2016, uh, or actually 2015, and starting with tax expenses uh, during one of 2016. So. Uh, for those of you today that might have a better grasp as to what the federal research credit is, um, how it works, et cetera, please be a little bit patient. We're going to start with the overview of your knowledge of the credit and then jump into um, the legislative changes uh, quickly after. Um, myself, you know, having been at this research credit for the last 15 years, my professional existence has been around purely raising education and awareness. Uh, around what I'll call the U.S. in a U.S. employee wage expense credit. In my opinion, this is really the best and proper way to understand and know this incentive, not as the R&D or research and development tax credit as it's been titled since 1981, but as a U.S. jobs or employment credit, you know, helping maintain and grow U.S. jobs, bringing competitive parity with other countries, um, who are also offering similar yet more lucrative incentives and for the sole purpose of motivating you, the business owner, um, to move your operations off our shores and onto theirs and into countries that have less um, limiting regulations. So um, note, I just wanted to highlight that, um, it does make perfect sense uh, why the federal R&D tax credit, you know, for over these three decades has thrown so many business owners and shareholders off through the years simply because of its title, right? It, it evokes thoughts of white lab coats, petri dishes, uh, which yes, this credit does absolutely incent, but everybody on the broadcast today, you're going to find that R&D based on Congress's definition, okay, is so much more than what you might think and not how Webster's de dictionary defines R&D. The, the bottom line is that this credit is about U.S. wages, okay, and the innovation um, of your employees. Um, the congressional intent, the reason the legislation exists, is certainly not for the purposes of giving out free taxpayer dollars, as improbable as that may sound to many on the phone. Um, this credit is also, though, not an entitlement. In fact, it's, it's far from it. It's, it's what you would call or might call a matter of legislative grace. Um, if you have the right facts and circumstances, then the credit is there for you and vice versa. What the Treasury has actually found is that for every dollar in research credits awarded, about $1.30 comes back in the form of increased tax revenue for the Treasury. So if you think about this, you know, going back to the congressional intent, it's probably more accurately described as helping the U.S. employer reduce the high cost of U.S. innovation. 
in innovation, you know, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes staff, it takes employees to move in an organization forward. And why the more accurate explanation or intent of why Congress incepted this is, again, to reduce the high cost of that employment, to increase, maintain, and grow U.S. jobs. This is the pure intent and why this incentive sets up so well for the A&E industry. Um, quick note before we dive into the slides, you're going to hear this word innovation. You already heard it uh, a lot during this broadcast, but the word innovation is not as daunting as it might sound when you actually uh, unpack it. You know, back to Di Webster's Dictionary, simply put, innovation is essentially, is essentially doing more with less, right? New or improved in ideas, information shakeup, new means, new methods as an example. And finally, let me make one last bold statement. If you are a U.S. company, you offer products and services on U.S. soil, and you are successful, i.e. you're making money, then there has to be a credit, a credit available to you. I mean, there has to be. I, I can say this so confidently because in order to stay successful, competitive, relevant, your organization must continue to look for ways to do what you do better, faster, stronger, cheaper. And this is exactly the types of attempts this credit reward. So again, thank you, thank you everybody for tuning in today. I know tax is not the most jazzy topic to discuss on a Wednesday, but I'll do my best to keep it a little bit exciting. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am one of the co-founders of uh, Corporate Tax Advisors. We are a national uh, tax consulting firm. We are not a traditional accounting firm, though we do have CPAs. We really are set up to be an augmentation uh, in addition to your tax team, okay? 99% of what we do, your CPA does not do, and vice versa. Um, these are the only areas of the code that, that we focus on, okay? And just so everybody knows, I am recording, we are recording this broadcast today. So if you are interested in um, having it for your archive, um, we'll certainly send that over to you. Olivia can do that, I can do that, and along with the slide presentation, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. So just a little bit of um, you know, an overview uh, is what we're going to talk about, um, how, it, uh, how it applies to the A&E design industry, and important de details on the, the recent law changes, which for those pass-through entities, S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships, this is going to be really important for you guys. Okay. Um, before I dive into exactly the legislation, I just want to highlight, because I've been at this for, for so many years and working primarily with the design industry, um, a lot of shareholders, when they first hear this, this nomenclature or this incentive called the R&D tax credit, research and development, their first gut reaction is, hey, we don't do anything innovative. We don't, we don't I mean, relative to making a widget, right, a tangible product, uh, product. And so over the years, it's been very much, again, around education, raising the awareness to the industry that actually what you guys are doing, you're on the front side of it. And I saw this in a uh, Design Life magazine in 2015, and this article highlighted that innovation begins with design, right? Designers are by nature and profession innovators, and it's essentially seeing what is not working and initiating change. So do note that, um, or, or do remember that you guys are really on the forefront um, of this uh, tax, uh, taking advantage of this tax legislation. Um, I was recently in New York City uh, presenting at a CFO conference, and the reason I like this slide is um, all the CFOs in uh, session this is kind of one of those proverbial world, word clouds, right? What was most important to CFOs in, your, in the design space. And two of the largest things they were talking about or desiring is growth and profitability. And this is exactly what this credit and sense. The other one is strategic plan that's in here and why it probably makes sense if you're not currently leveraging this incentive to build this into your strategy um, that will dovetail the profitability and growth. And this kind of highlights it for you guys. For those on the phone today that are not currently taking advantage of the R&D tax credit, if you compared yourself to a firm down the street that is, in order to um, uh, realize the same sort of cash flow as the entity that is taking the, the, the research credit incentive, and I don't know what everybody's profit margin is on the phone today, you would need to generate in excess of $800,000 in new top line revenue to realize the same benefit is a $50,000, an annual $50,000 um, uh, R&D tax credit. And the crazy thing is, is you guys are already doing those activities. You're already expending wages to attempt to do something. And why all it probably just takes is a little bit more exploration into this arena for the ability to take advantage of it, okay? The orders of magnitude of this credit 
are much, much larger than just a normal um, general deduction. This is a dollar for dollar federal uh, tax credit. Okay? I know we're moving fast, I just want to be sensitive to your time. So, if anybody on the phone today um, is ever bored, um, ever have, uh, ever have uh, bouts with insomnia, I would direct you to what's called IRC section 41, Internal Revenue Code section 41. And that's where the, the R&D um, verbiage, uh, the, legend, the, the statute, the regulation lives and breathes. And what it simply says is that R&D ha is happening if there is the, um, the development of a new or improved business component. Okay, now don't get wrapped around the actual on business component. It's really what you guys call a design effort, right? So it's the development of a new or improved design, okay? And it goes on to further highlight that if that design effort passes four distinct tests, which we're on, on back here very shortly, those activities tied to that project are going to qualify. And remember, this is a wage expense driven credit. It's about what you pay, your people are paid, okay? And so what the IRS is looking for is what are called QREs, Qualified Research Expenditures. So first, you, you're going to... Um, satisfy that fourth part test, again, which again, we're going to talk about the next slide, but then you need to understand what's the connection between the wage expense, i.e. the staff, and that qualifying design effort. And that's when we get into what are called QREs. And they're typically 95% of a design firm's credit is going to be generated by what are called qualifying wages, okay, typically the largest component. And what you try to understand or ascertain is over a, a, an average 2,080 hour annual work cycle, how much of their time as a percentage is working on design aspects that would qualify, okay? And then that becomes what's called their uh, uh, allocation uh, to the credit, it's a percentage, right? And then you take that allocation percentage times box one of the W-2, i.e. their compensation, W-2 compensation, and that becomes what is the, the, what's called the employee's contribution to the credit. And so you do that for everybody in the organization, and that's how you get to your credit, um, high-level credit amount, if you will. Now, the other area that tends to be the second largest component of a qualifying research expense is third-party contracting. So think about those people as an extension of your wage expense. So to the extent that you hire third-party technical uh, resources, um, there's an opportunity, potential of you um, benefiting um, or up to, you can qualify up to 65% of the costs or invoices paid to those entities, okay? There is a pie in here that says supplies. It's not really, um, there's not much happening in the design space relative to supplies or purchases. Think about annual purchases. That purchase could qualify as an R&D related expense, a qualifying research expense, if that supply is exhumed, destroyed, used through the qualifying activity. So you find that a lot of manufacturing. Think about raw steel that you know, gets transformed or used to go into exhaustible tooling or prototyping, et cetera. Now we do see some supplies or purchases that qualify in the design space for those firms that, that are pretty heavy on the 3D, um, uh, not, not BIM modeling, but you know, 3D, um, I don't want to say you guys are using construction paper, but you get the idea that some physical, tangible product that you go into building your models, scale models, et cetera. So not to say it's not there, it's just you don't see a lot of it, okay? So let's get into the four-part test. Now, again, you have to pass, all, the, the design activity has to pass all these, all, all tests, right? You can't just satisfy part one and, uh, or part, parts one through three and, and not satisfy the fourth. So these certainly are very important. Um, and, and how this works is that if you look at part one, test number one, it's called the development of a new or improved business component, as I highlighted earlier. But it's really, again, the development of a new or improved design package. And what it says is the taxpayer needs to be attempting to do something new or, and or improved to that design effort, okay? Attempting is a key word it highlights or shows that you're not spending money for the fun of it, right? Um, and what it says is you guys need to be attempting to do something new or improved to that design effort's function, performance, reliability, or quality, okay? 
Now, there are actually six book business components that are going on with any, with any business entity around the country. Um, products, obviously, are the biggest one, what you guys make and or sell, i.e. your design package. It could be the process, how you go about um, implementing those product designs or de um, architectural or engineering design. There's also software. Now, software isn't, we're not talking about the capital expenditure of buying something off the shelf that's readily available to industry, okay? What we're talking about here is code level development of some enterprise software, something that makes your bi internal business or external business better, faster, stronger, cheaper, right? So think about software. You're attempting to do something new and or improved to the function of internal software, okay? Or its performance or reliability or quality. Okay, so these are really the six areas. Now, the biggest area we tend to find in the design space is going to be your design effort. There's not going to be a lot flowing out from formula, formulas, inventions, techniques, formulas. It could be the use of um, algorithms, advanced materials, the, the testing, things like that. So it's not saying that those things aren't there, but primarily in the design space, it's going to come down to products. And again, remember, you, the taxpayer, need to be attempting to do something new and or improved to the design packages, function, performance, reliability, or quality. And remember, there's always a wage, a staff behind it that, that are doing and uh, uh, trying to accomplish those attempts, okay? Think about wage dollars as um, being expense. Okay, good. So the tech, second test is this test called the elimination of technical uncertainty, what I like to call the elimination of technical risk. And what it says is the taxpayer needs to be endeavoring to discover information that was uncertain at the outset of the project. So think about this, you get a client that asks you to develop design package X, right? You bring X into your internal resources, um, and let's say it's a half dozen people, you could invariably come back, they could come back with six different approaches to that. And what are you looking for? What's your client looking for? for? Your client is looking for, based on the facts and circumstances, based on the uniqueness of that design build effort, what's appropriate, right? What's the appropriate and final design? And what's appropriate today is not always what's appropriate, right? Competition changes the way you guys make your final delivery or appropriate and final design. Um, your knowledge gained from pr previous work um, change that, okay? And so think about those six people trying to figure out the best and appropriate way. They are doing R&D in Congress's definition as long as they're eliminating some technical risk or technical uncertainty. And most people say, when I talk and tra train around the country or bring this up around the country, they'll say, Dawson, you know, we've been in business for 20 years. We do our design efforts the same way that we today as we did back then. And I understand that, but if I were to then put back on you, okay, if there's no technical risk in your design efforts, which you supply back to your client, you're then telling me that a bookkeeper could do it. Right, a sales guy, non-technical salesperson can do it, and obviously people chuckle and say, "Well, that's not the case. They need to have some discipline knowledge in this space." And and I would then say that's correct, and why there is technical risk getting to that appropriate and final design. Okay, that's the second test. The third test, and this is really big, the, the biggest one. You know, it, we I, I said in the preamble we talked about this thing, the congressional intent. Why does this legislation exist? Well, it's, it's really test number three. It's called the technological in nature test. And it says that the taxpayer needs to be relying on some principles of physical science, engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, et cetera, um, in getting that design effort out the door. The, those people that are working on those efforts have to be relying on principles. And relying on the principles of is a key word. It doesn't require a formal degree. It doesn't form, uh, require a formal education doesn't require a LEED certification, doesn't require a, 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 a PE license, okay? As long as they're relying on principles of some physical science, it's not going to negate the ability to achieve or satisfy this third test, okay? Um, you know, I've met some crazy intelligent tool makers that, uh, quite honestly, some of them don't even have GEDs, but they're exceptionally intelligent and they're certainly relying on principles of engineering. Okay, these are the jobs, the disciplines, the know-hows of what the congressional body wants to keep, sustain, maintain here in, in the U.S., okay? The third test is the technological and nature test, 
Okay. And finally, the fourth test is this test called the process of experimentation. Okay. It says the taxpayer needs to be evaluating one or more alternatives in an effort to address the uncertainty they had in test number two, the technical risk. Okay. And evaluating one, I highlight the word one here because it does not negate the credit or that activity from qualifying, even if you get it right the first time, okay? You get, you get an attaboy, I mean, a solid job, but more often than not, um, in the design space, it's a very iterative process, right? There's stops and starts. Um, there's things that are gained or knowledge gained or, or uh, curveballs that are thrown at you through the design effort and why, um, you know, more often than not, it's maybe not happening uh, on the very first time, the very first time. The fact patterns that the IRS looks for, there's really three major fact patterns that highlight the satisfaction of the process of experimentation. The first task, the first process, most of us, uh, we know this, it's the scientific method, right? You have this hypothesis, um, you have this control group, you introduce a variable, and you measure and document the outcome, right? And you do that time and time again, introduce another variable. Now, that tends to be more formal than most design spaces in the architectural space or um, structural engineering, whatever the case may be. It's really more for those research labs. But the area where you guys are satisfying this process of experimentation is through the evolution of the design, right? Starting out from concept through final delivery. Um, if I were to focus on the architectural space, think about phase codes like PD, SD, DD, you know, design development, um, um, the schematic design, those areas is in you find some in schematic design too um design development that was is where most of the qualifying activity is going to happen as opposed to ca constructive construction administration okay and then probably my favorite and this tried and true process of experimentation is the old hat of trial and error right just rolling up your sleeves and getting that appropriate and final design out the door figuring it out as you go okay now everybody that was R&D, the R&D tax legislation on steroids, right? The four-part test. And usually when I go out and I train around this area of the code, if I had the opportunity to sit within your four walls and had everybody in the organization that are going to get a little bit of schooling on, on what R&D is and Congress's definition, I would certainly unpack that four-part test. But because most of you guys don't think through the optic or prism of tax, um, I like to provide a, a quick test, okay? Um, call it a way, an easier way for you guys to separate the wheat from the chaff. So if I were in your office, I would simply ask two questions of everybody in there. And the first question is simply this. Did you do anything today that was neck up, i.e., right, using your head, problem solving, designing, drafting, conceiving, uh, resolving uncertainty, um, all those INGs? And then did you do any of those things, attempt any of those things in an effort to make something better, right? Back to that new or improved. So there's a great chance that if they answered yes to those two questions, that the things that they're doing on a fairly consistent basis are going to satisfy those four tests that we just quickly walked through, okay? And then you just need to understand, okay, of those people that raise their hand, how much time as a percentage, i.e. hours of work per week, by monthly, monthly, or the case may be, how much of, a of their time in that design effort, in that phase code, is going to satisfy one of you know, those four tests and figure out, as it through an organization, how much of in aggregate is that, does that tie to annual wage expense, okay? Now, next logical question is, that comes up, okay, what are those typical types of qualifying activities? Now, mind you, the next few slides I'm gonna show you are not exhaustive. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what you guys might be doing within your four walls that would satisfy the four tests that we just went through. Now, obviously, these are focused on the engineering bent, but think about some of these bullet points. I'm not going to read every one to you, but think about alternative electricity conduction systems or, or improved ventilation. Back to that first test. What are you attempting to do, new and or improved, to the function, performance, reliability, and or quality of the lighting, of the ventilation, of the 3D modeling, of the acoustical qualities, okay? And remember, innovation, these changes, these new news, or this new aspects or improvements to the lighting and our ventilation 
they don't happen on themselves, right? It's staff behind it, wage being expensed to change or modify that function, performance, reliability, or, or quality of these aspects of your business, okay? Again, another list of things, material strength testing, product material transportation, waste and toxic waste disposal processes. Again, why are you doing these things? Client is asking you, and now you're attempting to do something new or improved to the function, performance, reliability, or quality in these areas of your business. Okay, again, not exhaustive, it gives you an idea. Now, same thing with arch the architectural space. You're designing master plans, developing construction documents, developing building facades, schematic designs. Why are you attempting to do those things? You're not doing it for the fun of it, right? You're trying to do something new or improved to the function, performance, reliability, or quality in that design effort through the, through the schematic design, okay? Again, not exhaustive. It gives you an idea. Developing unique lighting details, building shape and form, designing building systems, lead certification, okay? New or improved, there's some technical risk, right? What, what you, the taxpayer, in, are endeavoring to discover, discover information that was uncertain at the outset of the project. Your folks are relying on principles of some physical science, engineering, and ultimately, you're evaluating one or more alternatives in an effort to address the uncertainty in test number two, as you think through designing or improving the HVAC system for your clients. Okay? Again, a non-exhaustive list. You guys will have this in your um, slide presentation if you desire to have it, um, and it'll give you some direction. Um, obviously, these slides are not going to answer each and every nuance of what you guys are running into uh, in your phases of design effort through the day, but it gives you kind of an idea, okay? Um, now, relative to documentation, obviously the good old IRS uh, wants to, be, obviously the congressional body wants you to take advantage of the, of the incentive, or at least number one, they want you aware of it. Um, they are, obviously they write legislation, and you have the IRS that enforces the legislation. So there is a level of documentation that you need to have. Um, there are some firms out around the country that will highlight that because there was the, was the elimination of what was called the discovery test back in 2003, that you really don't need to have documentation. Well, I will tell you through the years and just understand how the IRS interprets what the legislative body has made a regulation, that is in fact not the case. You do need to have documentation. The discovery test was something that you had to be able to prove and show that the things that you were doing around R&D uh, were bulletproof, that, they were, that would pass that, those four tests. And it had to be new to the world. It had to be groundbreaking. But what happened is they removed that discovery test. It no longer had to be groundbreaking or new to the world. The way it reads today, and I'm paraphrasing here, is that as long as you guys are, even if, it, even if it's new to you, the attempt of what you're trying to, to, to get out the door on the design effort, as long as it's new to you, the taxpayer, it now potentially qualifies, even if someone down the street is, has already done something very similar, right? You wouldn't have gotten involved in that, in that effort if you weren't able to put your unique DNA on it or your competitive advantage on it, okay? So, but know that um, you do have to have documentation, but the great thing about the design space, unlike manufacturing that has Oof, duh. very little documentation in this regard. You guys have this data in your system. It's just usually not in, in a form that the IRS can uh, readily digest. You're going to find that in your time record keeping, in your project accounting data. Um, but there was also significant case law supporting your ability to estimate how much time is spent on R&D. Okay? So it's not as if you have to have an nth degree of documentation. You have to be able to show some level set of breadcrumbs that, hey, what you're doing satisfies the four tests, and you have the ability to do some level of what I would call extrapolation or estimating tied to the, your, your entire universe of all the de design efforts you make annually, okay? Now, the one thing I wanna highlight here, because this is, this is very important for the design space to understand, there is a list of what are called statutory exclusions. And what that means is that even if you have activities that satisfy the four tests, if you butt up against any of these statutory exclusions, it negates that design effort or the, that expense from qualifying. For example, there is a statutory exclusion for what's called foreign research. 
So if you think back to the business component of software, I, I, you're developing software because you're attempting to do something new or improved to function, performance, reliability, or quality within your internal walls. And so you're going to, you're going to code some software. Okay. Which is great. I mean, that, that, that activity coding, um, they're attempting to do something. There's some technical risk and uncertainty in what they're doing. They're relying on computer science and they're evaluating alternatives, that coding act certainly is going to qualify. But if you're paying that expense to someone that's doing the coding effort off U.S. shores, i.e. India or Russia or China, um, it's going to be excluded because of foreign research, right? Well, the big one for the design space is the statutory exclusion for what's called funded research. We call it, I like to call it an opportunity because if you're proactive on your contractual side, and we'll get to this in a second, it's a great chance that much of what you guys do for your clients um, relative to qualifying phase codes within that design package are going to qualify. But the exclusion it says here is it's for funded research, and, and it, it's present when one party pays another to conduct research or is paid to perform that research. Okay, so think about you guys. You're not generating a, a tangible product. And usually people are paying you to do that product, right? So most people say, well, Dawson, that sounds like funded research to me, okay? But what it comes down to, and this is where it comes into contractual language. Um, oops, looks like I need to get some ink. Anyways, it states that any research to the extent funded by any grant content or otherwise for another person or government is not qualified. But essentially, again, if, if you're basically given a, an open checkbook, right? And um, you're paid for your services regardless of the outcome, then it's going to be looked at as funded. Uh, but it's more, a, it's more about a legal question than it is an economic question. It really comes down to, to the extent the research, i.e. the design package, were to fail, who's holding the bag? Who, who, who has direct responsibility for that? And why, again, it really typically comes down to the contractual language. Okay? More often than not, in the design space, the best fact pattern highlighting risk is going to be firm fixed price, fixed price lump sum, okay? So the nature of fixed price contracts have been proven to show that they are inherently risky to you guys, okay? The opposite side of the fence is purely your cost. So if, again, regardless of the, fail, regardless of the outcome of the research, i.e. the design effort, your fully paid for your cost, that's going to be looked at as funded. Again, even if those activities pass all four tests, if more or more often, more uh, more often than not, your your contractual languages are set up, your agreements are set up purely time and materials, level of effort, then um, the risk is going to switch to the side of your client where they could then benefit from the research credit. And then you're going to find a myriad of other um, types of agreements, right? Um, time and materials not to exceed a cap, or there might be um, purely time and materials, but there are inspection and acceptance clauses or warranty provisions or milestone of achievement payments that might put the risk back on your side, depending on how you are paid for those things. But this will give you kind of a general arena um, to think about you know, if you looked at a pie chart, a percentage of how much of your design efforts are fixed, lump sum, as opposed to cost, to give an idea, uh, a barometer of, of where those things might fall relative to risk, and whether or not you're going to butt up against that statutory exclusion, okay? It's not black and white, but this will give you a good, um, again, a good direction to, uh, or a good barometer to understand where most of your contracts are going to fall in the qualifying status, okay? Again, that's key, something you guys really need to look at. Also tied to this funded research is that there is something called the retention of rights, okay? And it says tax, you guys should be able to demonstrate that you have the right to make similar designs. We're not talking about reverse engineering here, folks. If you have the ability to reuse the knowledge gained in that design effort, then you are maintaining some level or retention of the rights of that of, um, of that know-how, that IP. Okay, that's a good fact pattern for you. However, if again you have no rights um, to any of uh, the accumulated skills, advancements, etc., 
then that's going to hurt your, your case to show risk um, tied to the funded research uh, exclusion, statutory exclusion. Okay. Be good. So again, that was R and D, everybody on again the, on steroids. Um, certainly, that you guys will probably have more questions. Um, we can take some of them at the end of this presentation, but you can also I'll give you my contact information so you can ping me with questions or your accountant or CPA can ask questions. Um, the one area that we're focusing on now is this change to the research credit, and for those firms that are passed through entities, S corps, LLCs, sole proprietorships. Um, this is big news for you guys. You know, the credit, as I mentioned earlier on, though very briefly, it, it was incepted. It was started in 1981 by the Reagan administration. At that point in time, it was very much about the research labs. It had to be bulletproof, new to the world, groundbreaking um, ideas and activities that qualified for R&D. Um, but that had a major change in 2003. Um, as part of the Bush administration that was generated or pushed along because of the tragedies of 9-11 that really loosened the requirement. Um, but the, the issue was it had always been in a temporary status. It's never been a codified uh, regulation. So each year, businesses had to wait on the congressional body to see if there was even going to be a, be a law. Um, Congress finally got it right. Um, after 30 years. It is now, as of expenses starting January 1 of 2016, it is a permanent and codified regulation. There are a lot of people talking about the, the new uh, Trump tax uh, reformations, if you will, the upheaval of the tax code. I mean, I've heard it for years. If it happens, it happens. But I think it's a lot of it's posturing. So I don't know that that much is going to change. But they do highlight the R&D that if anything, most of what's going to change out there is is going to be outside of R&D. They really want to keep R&D because it's such, uh, next to Big Pharma, it was probably the largest lobbying effort in the country. Um, you know, think about firms like Oracle and PeopleSoft and Microsoft, all these companies, they take the R&D tax credit very handsomely, I would uh, I imagine. Um, so I don't think we need to, there's not a lot of alarm, at least in my viewpoint, that it's going to go away even with any major tra uh, tax um, reconstruction um, driven by the Trump administration. But again, it was made permanent starting January 1, 2016. Probably the biggest thing for the past two entities. Um, prior to uh, this new legislation, of all the firms that I've talked to, about 85 to 90 percent, not, not only were they qualifying for the credit, but the issue was is that you could only use the dollar for dollar tax credit to pay down federal tax, tax liability, but not below this thing called AMT, alternative minimum tax. And think about tax strategy. Everybody on the phone does what they can to lessen their, their federal and or state liabilities, right? It's what we do every year. And um, so most of these past two entities were at AMT, right, and, and intentionally so, on purpose, to, to keep their tax bill as, as small as they could. So even though they were generating credits, R&D tax credit, they could never use it because of AMT, okay? So the credit, um, just because they couldn't use it, the credit actually doesn't go away. They, you could take the credit and carry it back one year to a tax paying year, or you can carry the benefit of the credit up to 20 years. But if they're always proverbially or um, um, continuously in AMT, they could never benefit because of this AMT provision. Well, in the new legislation, that AMT provision has been removed. Um, and so essentially what that means is that it's no longer a barrier for the shareholders of an organization to, to take advantage of the credit. This opens up the floodwaters for firms that may have looked at this in the past but we're barred from taking it because of their um, tax liability situation. There's also, this is also big for those firms that have taken advantage of the credit and have, have, um, have had some advantage of taking some of the R&D, but a lot of it goes into a carry forward bucket, okay? Um, the way that this credit now works is that, well, prior, you, if you are consistently always around alternative minimum tax, you generate this R&D tax credit, but you could never use it because, you're again, you, you, you build up this bank of credits, but because of your tax liability, you never had an opportunity to, to deplete that 
um, bank of, of research credit. So it just, again, it never made sense to do a credit year to year to year to keep banking these credits. Well, it's now more strategic, more beneficial because these credits will eventually be used. There is an ordering rule. So if you do have a carry forward from a prior year, prior to 2016, you take, you first look at those credits to offset any AMT tax and then the new tax generated for any activities 2016 and 17 and on moving forward, you take that cre those credits um, to um, lessen your bill below uh, the ultra minimum tax level. So what I want you to take from that is that if you have taken advantage of the credit and you've had this big bank of carry forwards, they eventually now will start to be used. Um, so that's very big. There is one other um, opportunity in here they uh, for startup organizations I don't think there are a lot of probably startups on the broadcast today um, but think about a, a startup entity they certainly have qualifying activity but they weren't in a tax paying position right in their in their uh, formidable years their beginning years and why it never made sense for them well now they can offset up to a quarter million dollars in corporate payroll tax if they do not have a federal and or state liability um, on the tax side I do hire, highlight state. Now, most of what we're talking about here is the Fed, right? But there are actually 36, I think last check, 36 states that have a matching regulation to the Fed. So if you qualify the activity at the federal level, more often than not, it's also going to um, satisfy the stipulations in your, in your state regulation, okay? So there are a lot of firms on the phone today that can get both a federal and or state benefit. Um, I should highlight, digressing back to the AMT situation, that it's for those firms that are ESBs, eligible small business. So as long as you guys are less than $50 million in gross receipts, you're looked at as a um, eligible small business for that. Okay? Um, what I want to add to that, I think that's probably the gist of it. I guess the big thing I want you to take from this is it is a permanent codified regulation, if you remember back from the very first slide, if you're not taking advantage of the R&D, comparatively speaking to someone just next door that might be doing similar things to you guys, you guys are at a disadvantage, right? They are, their realized cost of their wage expense is less than yours if they are leveraging this, this incentive. And why? Because it's permanent and because now of the ability to offset AMT, it probably takes uh, or, or um, Probably makes sense for you guys to look a little, little, little bit further at it, okay? So, um, I guess the, what I want to add to this um, before we get into Q&A, I and mean, this is a very, again, very quick 50-minute discussion on R&D, and certainly don't believe that you guys are going to be experts after the case. There will be questions that come up, so, um, you know, I'll provide my contact information here in a little bit. But I do get the question a lot saying, Dawson, you made this bold statement. We are a U.S. company, we have a service we offer on U.S. soil, and we're successful, i.e. we're making money. Um, but the question they ask me is, what sort of credits are we talking about here? What's the bread box? Does it really make sense for me to in, in, involve any more exploration into this area if the dollar amounts aren't, you know, uh, palpable to me, right? Um, because let's not forget that you guys are not in business for the purposes of taking advantage of tax legislation, right? You're in business to get design efforts out the door. And we understand that. So I want to, uh, guys, just to highlight, I want to highlight this for you. If, if you. if you are intrigued or interested in learning more about what this might mean to your organization, we would like to, and this is on our dime, no cost to you guys, offer to present back to you a statistical model for you, your shareholders, colleagues, and your CPA to review. Essentially what we're gonna look at, and this is all under confidentiality, we're gonna look at your corporate expenses tied to wage expense, labor expense, um, third party contracting expense, and we're gonna butt your unique expenses up against a national database that's built through te treasury data and 15 years of data working with design uh, firms like yours. And we'll present back to you a model uh, call it a bell curve, a median or an average of what's being seen nationally, to give you at least an idea of understanding what these credits might mean to you guys. And know this, the credit is an annual credit, but if you've never taken advantage of the credit, you can actually reach back as far as the three preceding, uh, three prior tax years 
and get potentially back credits back in the form of a refund to include interest, if you can believe that. So the model that we'll present back to you will give you an idea of, of um, so that would mean that the years open right now are certainly 2017, 16, 15, and 14, okay? Um, the model will break down for you um, what your what you guys might need uh, what might be able to benefit from based on similar companies similar design efforts that you guys have been working on and you can start that assessment here and then for everybody that's interested um, I, I will also provide to you an, uh, an industry white paper to, to really unpack this a little bit further for you guys okay here is my contact information um, use it as you need it please um, and again, if you would like to have your uh, CPA reach out to us, I'd be more than happy to, to take that call. Um, so with that, Olivia, I'm going to turn this back to you to see what sort of questions we might have out there um, and keep this thing moving. Great. So I think that was very informative. Um, but we did have a few questions from the audience that came in that I'm going to ask Dawson and you can explain it as well as you can. Um, the first one is, what if we do not currently have federal or and or state tax liability? Yeah, so if you don't have any federal and or state tax liability, I guess I would kind of answer this a couple of ways. If you are a startup, there's a potential for you to offset corporate payroll tax. And when I say startup, you've got to be in your first three to five years of operation. I'm not going to, I don't want to get into too much detail with that. But let's say that you're a more mature business and you don't have any federal liability, but you do have the plans, um, uh, if you look two, three, four years down the road, that you're going to be in a tax paying position. It might make sense to understand how any credits generated in, say, 2016, even though you didn't have any federal and, and or state liabilities, you would still generate a credit, but it would go into a carry forward bucket. And that those credits carry forward up to 20 years. I would never recommend someone take advantage uh, of diving into the research credit if they couldn't use those credits in the first two to three years. Um, you know, the time value of money and that whole discussion. But just because you don't have state and or federal tax liability does not mean you don't have qualifying activity. It does not mean that you would not generate a credit. It really just comes down to the ability, uh, usability of when you would be able to use that. So hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question. Great. Um, the next one is what types of tax entities can take advantage of the federal research credit? Yeah, I kind of I kind of talked about this, but think about any tax uh, or entity any entity set up as taxpayers. They're obviously in their business for making profit. Um, but there are going to be tax, taxes, uh, liabilities that present themselves on the tax and federal side. So we're really talking about C-Corps, S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships, PSCs. The only firms that really fall outside of this is if you're nonprofit or if you're a fully owned ESOP, right, employee owned. Those would be really the ones that would be thrown out of the mix. There are firms that we work with that are not fully owned. They might be 50% ESOP owned. Um, that could still generate in, in a, a healthy credit. So it's most, most 95% of tax entities or entities structured, excuse me, out there that can take advantage of it. Good question. Are there any similar state incentives? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's some, there are some, if you guys are in uh, Arizona, any of the firms on the phone today, Arizona, um, Iowa. Um, there are a lot of firms that have some very healthy um, research credits that if you qualify at the federal, you're going to qualify at the state also. Some of them are, um, let's say that your federal credit was 50,000. Some of them are as high as 50% or 75% of the Fed. So if you had a $50,000 federal credit in the state of Arizona, it could be as big um, as, as the Fed, Fed level. Um, it all comes down to, again, where your state legislations are. There, there are some states, like I said, that don't have, uh, for example, Alabama, um, I'm trying to think, um, Virginia, Louisiana has a great credit. New York, New York state has a good solid credit. 
Um, but yeah, it's just gonna. I would just let, have, let your fingers do the walking. You know, you could you could Google uh, state research tax credit, and you would know very quickly or pretty quickly whether or not your state is going to um, offer such an incentive. Another does good using question. the federal research? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, does using the federal research credit increase our chances for an audit? Uh, yeah, it's great. This is probably the biggest question, and probably you know, I, there's no doubt, Hand, bar none, there's no other question that gets asked of us than that by CPAs and clients. And, and they get it; it makes sense. I mean, one thing I would first ask you guys to consider that every single tax return, every single tax return is at some level audited every year. What I mean to say is, and we don't know what they are, but the, it goes in electronically and the IRS has set up this database that's tied to flags on the end. So that every, every, every return is audited, but I, I guess to be more, that was kind of a coy way to answer that, but um, relative to audit, it, it potentially can uh, on a couple of things. If you guys have never taken advantage of the credit, and you're looking at, uh, at amending prior years to, to receive benefit of the credit, there is some chance because it actually goes through a formal desk review. It goes through the Ogden Service Center, Utah, okay? So there will be a desk review um, of that credit claim. So it, it can raise, but here's the thing with the design space, you guys have great record keeping. Uh, you have good, project accounting data and timesheet data. Uh, there have also been a lot of changes um, on the R&D front relative to guidance from the IRS. You know, when, when I was at the R&D tax credit between the years of roughly 2007 to 2011, there were a lot of audits uh, because the service agents were trying to get up to speed. You know, usually when legislation's passed, industry goes out and takes advantage of it. And then the IRS gets in behind and starts interpreting the way they, what they desire to interpret the legislation. So it takes some time to get into the system and the IRS review it. So there were a lot of audits back in the 2007 through 2011 timeframe. Um, they made it what was called a tier one audit issue. The, the commissioner at the time was a gentleman by the name of Commissioner Schulman. And they believed that this credit was of high strategic importance to the IRS. They believed firms were taking erroneous claims, high level estimating, in, making invalid assumptions on activities. And so they made it a tier one, which made it a mandatory, if any claim, any return in, included a claim for R&D, it was audited, okay? Well, after five years of exhaustive research, what they thought they would find, well, it was unfounded. 99% of taxpayers wanted to be voluntary compliant. So what they did is they removed the R&D placard of tier one. So we saw audits fall off precipitously. Then there are actually two ways you can calculate the credit. One is called the regular credit, which means you had to, um, I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds here, everybody, but the credit is, is an annual credit and it's called the credit for increasing research related activities. So it's about increasing year to year, okay? So in order to show it an uh, increase, you have to have what's called a base period. And if you've never constructed a base before, taking advantage of the credit, and you were a historic firm, that you had business, you were in operation in the mid to late 80s, you had to look back at that time to create your base, okay? So you would do some interviews, you would look at the type of activity that was happening back then and how did it match with the regulations the way they read today, and you would construct your base. Well, a lot of firms didn't have that documentation. I mean, think about two decades later, 25 years later, they have to go back and look, you know, look to the mid 80s, and the IRS knew this. And so what they were doing is they were attacking the base period um, establishment and saying, hey, listen, your, your organization has changed 50%, 75% turnover, whatever the case may be. We believe you're, you're, you're estimating. Uh, you're making invalid assumptions, and they were attacking that base period. Okay, so again, the reason we saw more audits back then. The other way you can establish the base is something called the ASC, the Alternative Simplified Method, and it's essentially that. It's a more simplified method. So in order to, how you construct your base, instead of going back to the mid to late 80s, you look at the three prior years 
to the first year you're taking the claim. So if you're taking the claim for 2016, you look at 15, 14, and 13 to construct your base period, okay? Well, people have that documentation, um, but you could only use the ASC on a timely filed return. Well, in July of 2014, that requirement was removed. You could now use the alternative simplified method on an amended return. When that changed, we saw audits fall off precipitously. And then finally, um, because of the budget um, uh, constraints of IRS, I just in five years, uh, Olivia, I haven't seen a major audit uh, on R and D. Um, not to say that they don't, they don't happen. They, they certainly are. I think there's more activity on the higher level. Think about you know the IRS run like an or, or, or a business organization. They're going after those firms that are going to be a bang for their buck. So credit annual credits in excess of 150, 200, 250 thousand dollars a year are getting looked at. Um, the firms below that, uh, we don't see a lot of data pointing into that. Now, again, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, it, it, it could increase your chances of audit, but unlike a manufacturer, you guys have great, great and solid documentation on uh, why I wouldn't be spooked by it. At least, you know, explore the credit, um, understand how good your documentation is, how good um, your design efforts are, passing the four-part test and go into taking a claim confidently. Okay, that's a long way of answering that question, so I apologize. There's just, there's not an easy way to exactly answer that. Um, there's no definitive yes or no. Um, it all depends. Oh yeah, okay. definitely understand. Great. Great <laughs> um, do we have time for one more question? One more, I think we got one more. Okay. We'll get to lunch. Or okay. <laughs> How much do studies like this typically cost? Okay, okay. Um, well, I guess the, the way to answer this is, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll kind of pull, pull in my own question too. We get a lot of questions saying, Dawson, well, why, why doesn't my CPA do this? Um, and this will kind of roll into this cost question too. And so let me first answer kind of my, my introduced question of CPA. I get, you gotta let the CPAs off the hook a little bit. Think about, about the body of tax law. It's the largest body of law in the world. Kind of compare the body of tax law to the body of medicine, okay? You and I can certainly go out today and WebMD ourselves, right? And certainly, if you went into a doctor, they would know the anatomy of your knee, right? But if you want, if there was an issue with your knee and you needed to have it scoped, you're probably gonna go out and see an orthopedic. CPAs, know the tax code, but the, I mean, I think there are over 9,000 regulations. I mean, it's something, something crazy. So they can't know everything. And so they're just, it's not an area that they've been comfortable with. And when they hear R&D, not unlike some of the people that are joining the call today, it evokes thoughts of white lab coats, petri dishes, and widget makers. They don't think about it in the design space, right? So um, they, your CPA, it's not saying they're not um, talented enough to do it. But unlike our firm that have design engineers and understand more about what you're doing, it might make, make sense. But now going back to cost, if you go out and get uh, and outsource this expertise to a firm like ours, there are other firms around the country, more often than not, firms are, are charging a, a percentage of the net usable credit to the client. So you're typically going to see, if your credit is $100,000, let's say, for example, most firms out there today that are outsourced, that you outsource, bring them in to augment your accountant to your tax practice that's not comfortable doing these, you can bank on the fact that it's going to be around 25 to 35 cents on the dollar. So every net dollar that's fine, it's going to cost you 35 cents or 25 cents, okay? And those fees, Olivia, typically include... The, re, the audit defense of it, if it were ever reviewed by the service, most of those fee structures include that those expert entities are defending the claim. It's not the client, it's not your internal comptroller, controller, VP of finance, it's not the CPA, it's, it's typically those expert teams, very much like our firm. So. Okay, I think that's, that's all the time that we yeah. have for questions, yeah. Um, just a reminder, viewers of the archive webcast must complete and pass the quiz with at least an 80% to receive continuing education credit. 
uh, live viewers should receive an email with your certificate in about one to two business days. And um, if you have any further questions regarding certificates or the technical side, you can email me at o j o n e s o jones at zygroup.com. And Dawson and I would like to thank you guys for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, I really appreciate everybody. I know tax is not always the funnest topic, and I, I did my best to try and make it. I don't think the word's fun, but... Uh, again, I, I thank you. And if there are any things that any other questions I can field for you, just let me know. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your week. And hey, and by the way, have a great, great Labor Day. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.